And it is my privilege to introduce you all to Mrs. Punky Tolson, Bible teacher and author. Punky Tolson's heart's desire is to help women fall in love with Jesus and live the life they were destined for. She is invested in the lives of women of all ages, teaching God's word, showing them how the scriptures really do work in their everyday lives and how Jesus makes all the difference. A writer, blogger, disciple maker, and a passionate communicator of God's truth. Punky, that's the nickname that her dad gave her many years ago, speaks locally and nationally at women's events, teaching the scriptures and sharing her life with her audience. Her story of finding identity, true love, and lasting satisfaction in Christ is full of transforming truth. Her amazing God story of marrying at the age of 43 will captivate you no matter what stage of life you're in. And her battle with breast cancer will reassure anyone experiencing any kind of difficulty that you are more than a conqueror in Christ. Along with her husband, John. John, if you can wave your hand here. Let's welcome John to our service today. <laughs> Along with her husband, John, she is co-founder of the Tolson Group, a discipleship-based ministry in Dallas, Texas. Punky is also the host of the Life on Life podcast, practical teaching and truth to help women know, love, and follow Jesus and challenge them to pass it on. And on a very personal note, may I say, I love John and Punky Tolson. They have been friends of Tiffany and I's for a lot of years. And as many of you know what my wife has gone through, Punky has been a great confidant and friend to walk through that with her. And also, um, my wife has the privilege, I can say it that way, of um, leading women's ministry at our church. And Punky's on the teaching team there and helps her with the leadership team. They're very involved in our church. Also, the book that our um, school has endorsed for discipleship was co-authored by Dr. John Tolson. So um, it's a very special moment today to have this couple here with us. Will you please help me welcome to our podium today, Mrs. Punky Tolson. morning. I might be the only person in here is, who is a Puviophile. Anybody know what a Puviophile is? It's a person who loves the rain. And I was driving over here thinking, you know, Lord, you did this just for me. I love a good rainy day. I even don't mind going out in it. But I am so grateful and honored, actually humbled, um, to be here with you all today. Grateful to Joe Allen for inviting me in and trusting me with a message for you all and to share God's word with you and encourage you in some way. I love to Dallas Seminary. I've never attended seminary, um, but I have spoken here a few times, so at least I can tell people I've been to seminary. But I, um, I, I love this place because in a compromising culture, in a compromising world, and even where there's compromise in the churches, this place stands on the solid rock of God's truth, the authoritative, inerrant truth of the word of God, the beautiful word of God, and um, what a blessing it is to sit here and soak this in from teachers, from professors, um, from faculty who believe that and stand on, on this book. The only thing greater and more beautiful than this book is the author of it, who I truly love. And I want to talk to you about him this morning, and I uh, have sweet friends who have prayed for me, and this time that Jesus would be lifted up, and that I wouldn't cry. So we're a minute into it, and that's going well. So i just uh, glad I had stuck tissue in my Bible. Um, I, I was asked to speak recently at um, a, a women's gathering coming up, and the, the woman that asked, invited me said, I'm just going to ask you two questions, and then I'd like you to just talk about that, expand on that, and just run with it. And the two questions um, she wanted to ask are, what is your advice to new believers, and what is your advice to believers who have walked with the Lord for quite a while? And I said, well, you know, it's really, they're the same. My advice, my counsel, the best thing I could tell you is to know this above everything. Jesus is more. 
He's just more. He's everything. So jealously guard your intimacy with him. I thought about you all a lot over the last months since I was invited here. I've prayed for you guys. It's fun to see, kind of see faces now that you've prayed for. Um, all of the work that you're doing, the hard work you're doing in seminary, and um, Andrew told me that it's finals week, so you've got that going on. We've got two seminary students that work alongside us in ministry together, and um, I know that this, it's hard. It's hard work, and it is um, hard going out into ministry as well. But I asked the Lord, how could I encourage you all? What could I possibly have to bring to you today other than the experience that I have in ministry and my love for Jesus? And he kept bringing one thing clear to my mind and to my heart. Give him a warning. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Give him a warning. Give him a warning to jealously guard their intimacy with me. So here's what I want you to remember today, and hopefully you'll remember it going forward. If you forget everything else I said, just remember that Jesus is more He's everything, so jealously guard your intimacy with Jesus because the work you do for Jesus, y'all, it has the potential to be the greatest threat to your love and intimacy with Jesus. Maybe you've experienced that just a little bit, even working so hard in classes. This is the loving warning and the prescription and the invitation that sweet Jesus gives to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2, that church that left their first love. You probably know that story. Um, this is also a warning and an invitation that I've taken very seriously. I've taken it to heart. I've had to apply it to my own life many times over the past 21 years of my life and not forget to remember that as I've worked alongside my husband in um, full-time ministry and vocational ministry. Um, so that's what I want to share with you today is just some thoughts from my heart that hopefully will encourage your hearts as you continue in your coursework here at DTS and go out into the world to serve God in whatever capacity he's called you to. Um, I met my husband, John, um, on a blind date over 22 years ago. And on our date, he asked, first date now, he asked me a question. And no one had ever asked me this on a, question, on a first date before. And I was 41 at the time. He said, um, if you could do anything you wanted to do, and if money wasn't a problem, and you knew you wouldn't fail at it, what would you do? And I thought for just a second, and before I could respond, he said, and what are you most passionate about? I'm like, these are some like intense first date questions. And I said, the only thing I'm really passionate about is Jesus, and I meant it. And if I could do anything, it would be to help women and men fall in love with Jesus and live that kind of life. And that might sound a little sappy or a little corny, but that really was the desire of my heart and still is to help people to know Jesus and to love Jesus and to follow Jesus. Because if they do, they will then help someone else to know Jesus and love Jesus and follow Jesus so that that person then can hope to help someone to know Jesus and love Jesus and follow Jesus. And it's very much go and make disciples, who will make disciples, who will make disciples. Little did I know I was about to marry into all of that kind of ministry. Um, but how I got to that point, I mean, I, I was not a church girl. My husband even said, I don't want to marry a church girl. I don't know what that, I mean, I guess that was a compliment in some way. But I wasn't. I, I didn't have a life that was perfect and far from it. I, I made a profession of my faith in, to Jesus when I was in high school, and then I quickly broke all my promises and went off in my own direction. And, I, and over the years, and it was a lot of years, I just got further and further away to try to find love and make love happen for me. Until I got to a point that was really a crash and burn moment and I was face down on the floor of my bedroom, hardwood floors just mashed up in my face. And I highly recommend that. It's a good place to be sometimes. And, and I just said, Lord, I give up. I give up. And if you are who you say you are and you can be who you say you can be to me, then come on in because I need it because I am done trying. And y'all, it was crazy, because I, I got up and I got on my knees, and there were a couple people in my life who I'd looked at and I thought, they don't just like know God, they are in love with him. And I remembered that and I thought, you know, if that's real, I, I want that. And I got on my knees and I just said, Lord, I wanna fall in love with you. And it was not like a beggy thing. It was like I was desperate. I'm like, I want to fall in love with you. I dare you. I want to fall in love with you because I have fallen in love and gotten my heart broken and I want to fall in love with you because if you are who you say you are, then you won't break my heart. And I got up 
off the floor, and I grabbed my Bible, and I read my Bible, and I didn't feel any different. And the next night, in defiance, I got down on my knees, and I said, Lord, I want to fall in love with you. And I got up, and I didn't feel any different. And I did it the next night, and the next night, and the next night, but I kept following up with opening my Bible and just daring him to help me fall in love with him. And after a while, I realized I couldn't wait to come home and grab my Bible and get in bed. And y'all, it was a great big old thick hardback life application study Bible first year it ever came out. And I couldn't wait to get in bed and just listen to him in his word. And I did that. I prayed. I, I read my Bible. I prayed God help me. I asked him questions. I cried a lot. I learned to listen to him. Just I read in his word when something I didn't understand was there. I just said, I don't understand this, Lord. Help me to know you. And I just started talking to him. And y'all, that is how I got to know him. That's where I fell in love with him. And one thing I know for sure, y'all, is we will never, never know and never, or we'll never love and never trust whom we do not know. And the only way we're gonna know God and love God and trust God is in his word, spending time in his presence and time in his word to intimately know and love God. So read your Bible every day. I've heard people say, you don't really need to read your Bible every day. I'm telling you, not in a legalistic way. You get to read your Bible every day, amen? You've got a Bible and nobody's gonna take it from you. As far as it is today, nobody's taking this Bible from us. We have the privilege, we have the freedom to worship and to read this Bible and study this Bible in this place and all over this country for right now. Thank God for that. You get to read your Bible every day. You get to engage with the God of the universe every day. You get to know who he is in his word every single day. So read your Bible every day. It's conversation with God, talking about him, talking with him, talking to him and letting him talk to you. Conversation with God and his word. Conversation, that's how intimacy starts, right? That's how intimacy's cultivated. So fast forward, John and I got engaged. And I was delighted, you know, now I'm, I'm 43 at the time, and we got engaged and was thrilled, and I was home one day doing some work and, I, and thinking about it, and I wasn't sad, I just started crying, like out of cotton picking nowhere, I started crying for no reason. I'm like, Lord, what is going on? Why am I crying? Why am I, why am I so full of tears? And to my heart, and I've never heard the audible voice of God, but to my heart, he said, you're just scared. And I thought, I am scared, Lord. I I really am scared. I'm getting married to John and I love him, but I do not know how this works. I don't know how to love John and to love you with all my heart. I don't know how it works. It's always been just me and you, Lord. And again, to my heart, he said, Punky, it's always gonna be me and you, but you are going to have to fight hard to keep it that way. You're gonna have to fight and remember not to forget, to remember, to keep me first. And that's the warning and the encouragement Jesus gives in this passage in Revelation. And so I want to read this to you quickly. I'm actually gonna read it from a different translation. Um, to the, this is uh, Revelation 2, 1 through 7. To the angel of the church at Ephesus, write these words, Jesus says to John, as he dictates. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary, but, and there's just that pause, but I have this against you you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God." I have this against you, you have abandoned the love you had at first. Other translations you have might say you left your first love. So what can we learn from this church 
and these Jesus people in this church, hard work in Jesus people. Jesus affirms their serious dedication. Everything they're doing is good stuff. They're working hard. Their doctrine is sound. They're doing the thing. Who wouldn't want to go to a church like that? Who wouldn't want to pastor a church like that? Be a church person, a Jesus people in a church like that. It, they were great. But then there's that one but, and you can almost just hear this collective inhale. I have this against you that you have left your first love. That word left means to abandon. It means to forsake. It means to leave like a husband divorcing his wife. It's not an accident. It's an act of will. It's a choice. And that's serious, y'all. And what is first love? What does it mean here? It's priority love. It's first, most, and best. In priority of our time and our undivided attention. It's first love. That first love is love that we had at first for Jesus when we first came to know him, when we first realized what he had done and discovered all that he is and all that he has done in saving us. Just like we've sung about this morning, what his blood has achieved for us and conquered for us. So Jesus is saying, you left your first love. You, your love for me is not what it once was nor where it once was. Your head is in the work, but your heart for me is not. So with laser focus, Jesus, the heart knower, looks right at the source of the issue, which is the heart. Why? Because the heart of the matter is always a matter of the heart, is it not? The Bible talks extensively about our heart and how it goes astray, prone to wander. Our hearts were built by God, built for God, built to be filled with the love of God so that we can love God first, most, and best. Our hearts operate optimally when God is in the right place, in the first place. We know that. We all know that. We know what the first commandment is. I mean, we can probably say the first commandment, uh, the greatest commandment that Jesus talks about, and th th to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We understand that. We know that. That's the shining hallmark of the Christian, is it not? That we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But what happens is that we get so full of doing all the things and all the stuff. Our life gets crowded with life and more of it. Abundance and busyness, good stuff, and all the good stuff, the life and the ministry, get pulled to the foreground of our heart and God gets pushed to the background. Mm. Maybe you've sensed that in your own life. A.W. Tozier says this, we have become so engrossed in the work of the Lord that we have forgotten the Lord of the work. The most important thing, the first commandment to love God wasn't even mentioned in Jesus' long list of accolades to the church at Ephesus. Their work for God had taken God's place in their heart and the fire went out and the love walked away. Don't forget to remember to jealously guard your love and your intimacy with Jesus because it's the work you do for Jesus that poses the greatest threat to your love and intimacy with Jesus when you give your heart to it. The risk, remember, is not that you'll lose your love. He didn't say you'll lose your love your first love, that, but that you will abandon it, neglect it, ignore it, leave it, walk away from it. So how does that happen? How do you do all of that good work and leave your love? How does the fire and the intimacy go away for Jesus when you're that involved in all that work? Some of you probably know and have experienced it. We become careless, much like a man or a woman who neglects and eventually walks out and leaves his marriage or her marriage because the love is gone. We can easily become distracted, infatuated with other things and our attention then shifts and our priorities get shuffled around. Work and ministry life take first place. We figured we're doing good work for God but essentially what we're doing is we're putting a hand up to Jesus and saying, not now, Jesus, my calling is calling me. Not now, Jesus. And do we ever get around to later? Before you know it, the main thing is no longer the main thing, but just one of many things. And the fire dies down and the lead goes out of all of it and y'all, the intimacy is gone. And it's the intimacy with Jesus 
that we need. It's the intimacy with Jesus that he wants with us. And it's a gradual, slow bleed. It comes on you subtly. It doesn't happen because we're engaged in the wrong things. It happens because we're engaged in the wrong ways. We have wrong priorities. We shift from being in a love relationship with Jesus to a work relationship with Jesus. We become busy and distracted and lots of good work starts then to strangle the love life right out of us. The desire of our heart fades from knowing God intimately and making him known to making our church, our ministry, and our service to him known. We lose our awe and wonder of God and our joy that distinctive hallmark or the hallmarks of the Christian who loves Jesus first, most, and best. Naturally, we end up losing our love for other people because it's out of our, the overflow of our love for God in our heart that we're able to love others. So we grow edgy and resentful when things don't go the way we planned. We start wanting to smack the sheep instead of lead the sheep. You laugh, you wait. <laughs> It happens. We think less about what truly pleases God and we think of God less when he is so much more, y'all. He's so much more. He's everything. Remember that the Ephesians hadn't lost their first love, they left it, which is good news because what it means is that there can be a return to their first love, a return. And Jesus is always wooing us back. Every single day he woos us, he invites us to return home, to come back, to come be with him and rekindle the fire of our love for him every day. We gotta stoke that fire. Just like a marriage, you gotta keep that fire burning. So how do we do that? How do we rekindle? How do we um, take care and tend to that fire of intimacy with our first love? Well, here's the prescription and the invitation that Jesus gives. Remember, repent, and return. He says, remember from where you've fallen. Go back and think back to what it used to be like when you first met Jesus. Like the song we sang, remember what he's done for you. Remember when you had that awe and wonder of, this is what he's accomplished for me. He saved me from eternal death. He saved me from a realization of being separated from God forever. All of the things, go back and remember, it will start that fire again and then repent. <clears throat> he says repent, which all this is serious because he's saying repent, meaning repent of not loving me first, most, and best, not of, of leaving your first love, meaning it's sin <clears throat> to not excuse me, to not hold on to the first commandment and to believe that and to obey that is sin. And he says, repent, change your mind about the way you're going and doing things and turn around. Y'all, we get to repent. The grace and mercy of God is that we get to repent and turn it around every time we remember that we're doing it wrong. And then he says to return, to go back and to do what you did at first, the works, the things that you did at first. Return to your first love. <clears throat> One of the fun things that John and I get to do in ministry is premarital counseling. We do marriage counseling as well, but we do a lot of premarital counseling this year. We've done like six different couples. It's been absolutely a joy. And one of the things that we remind them in going through this is as the years go by, and this is what our pastor told us when we went through marriage counseling, premarital counseling in Orlando. As the years go by, tell and retell your love story to one another and tell it to other people. Everybody loves a good love story. And the keeping, that will keep your love alive in telling your love story over and over again. You might be scratchy with your spouse, but boy, you start talking about when you first met and what it was that, that attracted you and how you had that first spark. And all of a sudden, you know, it doesn't really matter that he left his dirty clothes on the floor. You know, you just start thinking, you know what? I've been getting so scratchy and annoyed at the little things. Keep your love alive with Jesus. Go back and remember the way it was at first. Return and do the things you did. So my experience in vocational ministry took me far away. I mean, I had that I've left my first love season. We had gotten married 
Within the first year, we started getting calls about coming to Dallas and thinking and praying about moving here. We made that decision. The following year, moved here um, just after we had had um, our second anniversary. So I was really still a young bride, a new bride. When young, I was new. But I was, we, um, <laughs> ish, I was young, ish. Um, uh, we started new ministry here in Dallas, and um, it was hard. It was a really hard couple of years, but then it kind of got on a roll, and I was doing all the things. I was teaching two Bible studies a week. I was being asked to speak in different places. I was traveling here and there. I was discipling women. I, was, I had a husband, so like he had to eat, so I had to do all of that. And it just hit me. Like, I am burned out on this. Like, I, I'm just exhausted, just worn out. All of the work, all of the good work. And I had edged Jesus out. I was still having a morning quiet time, but honestly, y'all, I was getting up and talking to, to God briefly and then opening up my Bible. And really, I was reading my Bible to figure out what I was gonna study or what I was gonna teach next. It wasn't just time alone with him again, like I used to have, to just hear him speak. So I was exhausted, and um, something happened to uh, a friend of my cousin in um, Orlando, a little girl who went to school with her son, had become quite ill um, with a heart condition where she actually had to have her heart removed and she was hooked up to something called a Berlin heart until the transplant recipient could be found. And um, I was reading journal entries in her um, caring bridge and reading these stories of how this little girl was so alive with Jesus and she would kind of go under in, in a sleepy twilight with this anesthesia they would give her and she'd come out of it and sometimes her hands would be lifted in, in praise and she would sing and she would just talk about Jesus and how beautiful he was and the things he was showing her and I would sit there y'all and I would bawl reading these. I would just bawl and I just kept thinking, I have lost my dance and I want my dance back. I want what she has. I miss my dance with you, Jesus. I remember reading these to my husband and just crying and just thinking, oh Lord, what's it gonna take to get back? And I made a slow turn, but four months later, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I knew almost instantly that this wasn't gonna be just about cancer and a tumor in my chest. It was gonna be about my heart. In fact, I joked and I said, I'm getting a new breastplate of righteousness. Well, what does a breastplate of righteousness cover? Your heart. And indeed, I said, Lord, if we're gonna do this thing, then let's do it all, because I don't wanna be the same woman coming out of this that I am going into it, so have your way. Come in and do everything you need to do, because I want my heart to beat for you first again. And that was three, that was 13 years ago, 13 years ago. So I took the prescription in Revelation 2. I stopped and I remembered what it was like in the beginning when I was desperate for Jesus and I was so desperate for him and grateful for his grace and his mercy to me for all he delivered me from. I remembered all of that. And then I turned around and I repented and I prayed to fall back in love with him again and keep falling in love with him. And then I returned and I did the things that I used to do when I first fell in love. I made time for him. I listened to him in his words, spent regular time with him, because you know, y'all, it's not gonna happen by accident. It's just not. We're not gonna grow in our faith by accident. We're not gonna grow in our depth of intimacy with God by accident. You're gonna have to make time for it. You're gonna have to jealously guard it by making time for it. It's much more than a daily quiet time, but that is a big part of it. And quickly, as I started doing these things, I quickly felt home again in his presence. So, desperate to guard my love for him, to guard that first love and intimacy with him, I started praying. I started praying what he told me in his word that he wanted for me. 
I prayed, first of all, to love him first, most, and best. In fact, it was a new year, and I thought, what if I, you know, that's the first commandment. What if that's all I pray for a year, or the biggest thing I pray for a year? Lord, I want to love you more than anything and anyone and desire nothing on this earth as much or more that I desire you. And I prayed that every day for a year. It's not a magic prayer but I firmly believe that what God says in his word that he desires and wants for us, that we pray for it. When he says to, pray to have that, to want that. And so I prayed, I prayed for more of him. I prayed to know him better, to stay hungry for him and hungry for his word, to desire his presence, to hear his voice, to know his voice above all the other voices out there. And I prayed more than what I want, Lord, I want what you want for me. I prayed to be satisfied and filled up in all my empty places with more of him because he is so much more. And I still pray these things, y'all. I still pray what God wants for me in his word. My mom had the sweetest relationship with Jesus the last 10 years of her life. She had such intimacy with him. Her life had gotten very, very small. Um, My dad was gone. She'd moved into an assisted living and she was in a tiny, tiny, tiny little apartment. But boy, her love for Jesus and intimacy got enormous, y'all. It was crazy. I did not grow up with that mother. She was not the mother I knew the first um, several decades of my life. She had just gotten this crazy dance with Jesus that like every time I talked to her, she would talk about him as if he was right in the room with her in the conversation she was having. She couldn't wait to go to the grocery store. She would go to a certain time of day when all the workers were stocking the shelves and she'd talk to him about Jesus. And every time I had a conversation with her before she'd hang up the phone she'd say and don't forget talk to Jesus he's your best friend that wasn't my mom that raised me that was my mom that found Jesus so late in her life and boy was it beautiful boy was it breathtaking talking brings intimacy and he was the only person she had to talk to many days but she came a little, became a little witness for Jesus in that assisted living. Cultivate intimate conversation with Jesus because nobody knows your heart like Jesus does. So talk to him about what's on your heart and talk to him about what's on his heart. What it was like for me in the beginning was I was desperate for him, for more of him, and at first I didn't even know it. What was it like for you in the beginning with Jesus. Go back and remember that and don't forget to keep on remembering. Don't forget to keep on remembering to guard your heart and affections for him. The Apostle Paul writes something so beautiful in Philippians 3. I'm going to read it to you from the Amplified Bible because I just think it's so rich. He says, for my determined purpose is that I may know him that I might progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, and that I may in some way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, which it exerts over believers, and that I may so share in his sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit into his likeness, even into his death, that I might progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. Make that your determined purpose, to know Jesus, to love Jesus, to follow Jesus more deeply and intimately. Be intimately acquainted with the Savior of the world. Chuck Swindoll in his little powerful, maybe the best book he's ever written that I've ever read that he's written. Intimacy with the Almighty. It should be required reading for every one of you. Run, do not walk in the rain to the bookstore and get this book. He says this, not more intimately acquainted with theology or with the church or with sharing Christ with others, as important as all of that is, no, none of the above, but with Christ, with him and with him alone. Charles Spurgeon says, oh, to have the most intense craving after the highest good. Y'all, Jesus is more. 
Jesus is everything. Nothing you do, no sermon you preach, no message you write, no church you build, no choir you lead, no book you write is more important than loving him with all your heart, first, most, and best, always. So jealously guard your relationship with Jesus. He'd rather have you than the work you do for him. That's the truth. He doesn't want the work. He wants your heart. And when your heart is with him, the work becomes so rich and so beautiful. Like the woman at the well in John chapter four who falls in love with Jesus and runs back to the town and they follow her back to the well and want what she has, that's what we want. We wanna be men and women who walk this planet, who leave this seminary and go to all ends of the earth and have people look at us and desire what we have because we have Jesus and they can see it. That's what we want because there's nothing we wouldn't do for the object of our truest affections. Isn't that right? There's nothing we wouldn't do and nothing, nothing, nothing testifies to the reality of Christ more than a man or a woman to whom Jesus Christ means absolutely everything. That's who we want. That's who we wanna be. That's who we want in our churches. That's who we want in our pulpits. That's who we want as counselors. A man or a woman to whom Jesus Christ means absolutely everything. So you go, you go, return back to that well. Everything you need is at that well. There's not anything that Jesus has that's gonna be something you don't need. You need everything. No one will ever, ever love you like Jesus does. And you'll never find anyone worth loving more than him. So will you pray with me? Lord God, we want to love you more than anything and anyone and desire nothing on earth or in heaven as much or more than we desire you. And it's in the beautiful and matchless name of Jesus that we pray. Amen and amen. And God bless you. <laughs>